Look at the Boston players smiling. But Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away. Pumps it in. 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big Three NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Big Three NBA Podcast. I'm your host, Ashra Blakely, and I'm joined today by starting to be a regular on the program here, Mr. Michael Curtis, uh, covers the Dallas Mavericks. What's going on, Mr. Curtis? How you doing, sir? Doing good, man. Just enjoying a couple of days without without having to touch the keyboard. That, that's That's been different for me lately. Man, you, you need to make the most of those moments because they don't last long and they don't come around very often. That's for sure. Especially when you got a team that's kind of nice, uh, which is something that, again, folks in Boston are like, yeah, that's us. But Dallas had a great season. You had, I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff, uh, that you were involved with. And, and certainly, you know, just for folks, just to catch them up to speed, uh, Michael came to Dallas from Detroit. So as you can mention, as you, as you can probably know, not only is there a geographic difference, but there's also in terms of quality of play difference. So uh, needless to say, uh, Mr. Curtis has gone from the ashy to classy class of basketball going to Dallas. Uh, and the Celtics, they feel pretty good about what they were able to do this year. Obviously winning a championship, uh, beating the Mavs, you know, in, in, in five games. And the Celtics, they did what – you know, you would assume teams do, but they don't always do that. And that's try to bring the band back so they can run it back again. And then you look around the rest of the NBA, not so much. Lots of teams made moves. Philadelphia, they added Paul George. The Knicks added Mikhail Bridges and they re-signed OG Anubi. And then there's the team that we're going to talk about today, the Dallas Mavericks, who brought in, I would say, the most accomplished free agent out there in Klay Thompson. And, and you know, just right off the bat, you look at his resume, four-time champ, Five-time All-Star, All-NBA. He's done anything and everything you could possibly imagine someone 34 years old can do. But the question that everyone is wondering is, what can Clay bring to the table at this point in his career, particularly for a team like Dallas that obviously the bar is, is pretty clear. It's, it's try to win a championship. Yeah, I, th- I think it's interesting in the fact that all season long, the Mavs needed a third score to complement Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, um, some nights it would be P.J. Washington. We saw that in the Oklahoma City series. Um, some nights it would be Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively, especially when they got the lob game going. But when you get at a guy like Clay Thompson, who's an elite sharpshooter, um, he's only shot less than 40 percent from three in his career twice in his 13 seasons. And granted, he didn't play for one season, but still, that's a pretty significant mark. Um, they just want him to come in and knock down shots and be Clay Thompson. They don't need him to score 60 points in three quarters. I'm sure they want him to be game six Clay more often than not, but that's probably not the case at this time in his career. Um, but he's going to get a lot of opportunities just because of the gravity and attention that Luka and Kyrie gets. Um, and he's going to have ample opportunity to knock down those corner threes, which that's why they didn't win against Boston because one, they weren't getting those looks and two, when they did get them, they weren't knocking them down. So I think if he can just come in and just knock down shots, um, it'll add a whole new dynamic to their offense. Now with the addition of clay, you're right. I mean, he gives them that, that bona fide legitimate, you know, every day and Sunday kind of shooter that they absolutely want to have. How do you think it's going to work as far as fitting in with, you know, with, with, those other guys, uh, you know, specifically Luca and Kyrie. I mean, it's it would seem on paper that it's a pretty na- should be a pretty seamless fit. I mean, it, is it expected to be relatively seamless uh, when he joins? I mean, are there are there some things that he maybe needs to adjust to or adapt to that might be different than what he's used to uh, when he was in Golden State? I think it's definitely going to be a different dynamic. He probably won't get the same usage as he did in Golden State. Um, you got two guys who are extremely ball dominant and a lot of Dallas's offense revolves in isolation, whether it's Luke at the top of the key, um, making plays for himself or others, or if Kyrie's trying to get it going, which we know he's all capable of doing. Um, I think for Clay, it's going to be a lot of waiting, playing the waiting game, maybe being in the corner. Um, but when he gets his opportunities, that's when he has to kind of um, take advantage of. Them. I think um, on the defensive end, that's going to be something that <laughs> 
I, I think it's going to be a challenge because we all know he's not the defender that he once was. He's 34 years old right now. And um, those legs don't move like they used to. And you're <laughs> right. trying to come in and pretty much fill the gap that Derrick Jones Jr. laid before him um, there at that three spot. Of course, they're all going to start together. So you got you got a Clay Thompson who's going to shift to the small forward position. And I think um, – just it's, it's going to be an adjustment. I don't think it's going to be seamless to start, but I think once they do get their groove going, it'll be what we all expect it to be. Yeah, because for most of Clay's career in Golden State, he was one of the better wing slash perimeter defenders in the league. And, you know, when you look at his, his his body of work at that end of the floor, it wasn't like he was, you know, locking kids up because he had this ridiculous length or great athleticism. He was very much a smart, high basketball IQ defender who was very good at being what you would call a positional defender. He was always in the right place at the right time. But kind of, you know, just piggybacking off what you mentioned uh over time you can't be at the right place at the right time because your body's like dude we ain't we this ain't 28 year old clay this is 34 year old clay uh who's had missed a lot of time with injuries and the feet just don't move like they used to uh and it, it, it definitely, you know, for, for those of us on the outside looking in, you certainly see the benefits of, of adding a, a sharpshooter like Clay. But you know that there's probably, you know, there's a reason why Golden State was was open to the idea of just kind of letting him go and why they didn't weren't more vigorous in, in their attempts to keep him. And, and that was what I, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, were you surprised at the level of ease at which Dallas was able to get him and specifically the fact that they were able to get him and they didn't, they weren't the highest bidder for him. I mean, they're, they're, Clay could have made more money elsewhere. There, there's no doubt about that. And what does it say about this Mavericks team that they can get a guy like Clay and they didn't have to, they did not have to actually outbid anyone to get his services? Yeah, I think this team being three wins away from a championship um, said a lot to do with Clay's decision. Um, when you add somebody who, can shoot at the caliber that Clay is capable of um, to a team that needed offense. We we all know that we all thought that Dallas was going to be okay in the offensive area. That wasn't the case in the finals. Um, so when you add a guy like that, who all you want him to do is just go spot up and shoot, knock down shots. Um, he might not get the volume that he's used to, but um, he's going to get opportunities. Um, I think this is the opportunity where he can win. If you look at his other suitors, um, the Lakers, they they haven't they haven't been a championship contender since the bubble in 2020. Um, so I think it's going to be just I think what what he was looking for was one. He wanted to come in and be respected. Um, I think that had dwindled in, during his time in Golden State. A lot of um, reports have shown that. And I think he wanted to go somewhere where he will be valued and where he has the best chance to win. Of course, he could have made a lot more money um, going elsewhere, but I think just the culture and what they're trying to do here in Dallas, um, that gave them the advantage. Yeah, I mean, it, it. even though obviously it's a very different situation, but, you know, with the students that I deal with at Boston University, one of the things I talk to them all the time about is trying to find places and spaces that understand and appreciate your value. Mm -hmm. And Clay, his decision to go to Dallas clearly was an indication of that. As you pointed out, Michael, the fact is he, he will have a prominent role in that team that is a legitimate title contender. Uh, he will have a prominent role uh on a team that values him highly. I mean, it, it, they, there was absolutely no, uh, there was no doubts that he was their number one target. And I think for a 34 year old guy uh, in the NBA, knowing that, you know, you got the, you got kids damn near half his age coming into the league. Uh, so for you to still have value uh, at a high level on a championship caliber team that had to make a significant impression on him. But yeah. As good as Clay is and as great as, as the love festival Clay is right now, at the end of the day, it comes down to one thing and one thing only, winning games. And when you start looking at the West, and I know you study them closely, there's a lot of big dogs in the Western Conference still. Uh, even with you know a guy like Paul George coming out east, uh, where does this move put them in the pecking order? Because people, you know, even though they had a great run, I think Dallas had, what, the fifth best record in the West last year, I think. Yeah. So what, what is this particular move adding Clay? And they, and they made some other, you know, you know mine was the, the, the Marshall kid, Najee Marshall uh, from New Orleans, they picked up as well. But where does this particular move 
put them in terms of that Western Conference pecking order? Yeah, it's funny. When I was interviewing for this job back in, I want to say February, March, they were teetering around the play in. And <laughs> people probably didn't even think they were going to make the playoffs, but they won 16 out of 18 at one point, got all the way to the fifth seed. But I still think they're going to be a top four team in the Western Conference. Um, you look at OKC has gotten significantly better, adding Isaiah Hardenstein and Alex Caruso. Um, they got, um, I forgot the, the rookie, Nicola Topic, Nicola Topic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, that they, they, they added some depth to that team, which was already deep. They were a little thin in the front court, but I think they're going to be right there. You um, look at the Minnesota Timberwolves, they're going to be back. You add a guy like <laughs> Rob Dillingham in the draft who, some people are comparing to a miniature version of Kyrie Irving um, where he can kind of grow and learn under Mike Conley in his first year. I think that'll be really good for Ant um, and the rest of that team. You look at um, the Denver Nuggets. They're not going anywhere. I know they just lost KCP to Orlando, but you got to think with Nikola Jokic, um, he's going to have that team still mm -hmm. as a top contender. So I think Dallas can be right there in the mix. It's just going to depend on um, what this team does, is Luka going to be healthy by the time the season starts? Um, are they going to be able to get the pieces to kind of fit? Because you mentioned Najee Marshall. is He was basically brought in as the guy to replace Derrick Jones Jr. in the event that they weren't able to retain him. And obviously, Jones chose to go to um, the Clippers. And then Dallas also added, which the trade was just made official now, Tim Hardaway Jr. They sent him to Detroit. They got Quentin Grimes in return. Um, he's a young 3 and D guy who really didn't get a chance to show his talents in Detroit just because he was injured. Um, and he had a solid season last year for the Knicks, but he just struggled with the injury bug this year. So if he's healthy, he's going to be able to have a chance to contribute off the bench too and just add some more solid defense and um, shooting that they can benefit from. But I think this team is definitely a top four team. I, I when I'm, I'm glad that you brought up Quentin because uh, I think when we look back at this off season and you start looking at maybe the top five below the radar trades, I think Quentin Grimes might be in that list. Uh, Quentin can play. Uh, Qu Quentin, I, I, I mean, is he an all star? No, but he's a much better player uh, than to be just kind of a throw in type of of a player, uh, which you know he, he was essentially for this for the money to work and all that. Um, I think that I think he's one of those guys that he could be, you know, when we get to December, January, February and things start to settle down a little bit as far as who's in the top tier and who's just kind of hanging on. I think he could be a real significant player uh, for the Mavericks this year, because, again, I, I think he's a good player. I think when he's been healthy and he's had opportunity, I think he's shown himself to be someone who can help teams uh, win some games. But another guy who you mentioned earlier, who I think was was one of those X factors for Dallas this year uh, was Derrick Jones Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he to me, he another example of a guy just getting an opportunity with a little bit more pressure, a little bit more spotlight. He did some good things. Now, when people look at the moves that Dallas has made and they look at who they lost and who they gained, I, I think there's almost this knee jerk reaction to think, well, they lost Derek Jones. And so they're bringing in Clay. So Clay is going to fill some of those needs, if not most of those needs. How will Clay go about filling the void left by Derek Jones, if at all? Yeah, it's going to be tough because they're two completely different players. You got Derek Jones Jr., who's a versatile wing, who can guard multiple positions, can jump out of the gym. I think that's that's the main difference right there, the athleticism. Um, Luca and Kyrie and the rest of the Mavs guards, they're not going to be able to throw lobs to Klay Thompson. Um, they'll be able to find him in the <laughs> no, corner. Steph couldn't throw lobs to Klay Thompson. Draymond didn't throw lobs to Klay. No, Klay ain't that dude. Yeah, they'll be able to find him in the corners. But that that aerial game that that made Dallas so potent um, in the pick and roll game, um, they're going to miss that. They're still going to have it in Lively and Daniel Gafford. But right. um, from Derrick Jones, that that's what he provided in addition to his defense, and he occasionally could knock down a corner three. Um, I think that's where Clay is going to be able to make up for what D. Jones couldn't provide this team. He's going to be able to knock down those shots because um, he's going to get a lot of them, like I mentioned. But I think when it comes to Derrick Jones, he, he was a really good like glue guy for this team. 
especially for that front court defensively when you have D Jones, PJ, and Gafford and Lively. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll lose his defense for sure, but they're gaining offense. But they're hoping that Najee Marshall can kind of step in and fill the gap that um, D Jones left. And I think when you just look at the additions and the subtractions, mm-hmm. you look at Clay Thompson, let's say he's the Tim oh, – I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> um, let's Thumbs say up he, on this end too. Yeah, let's say he's the Tim Hardaway replacement. Let's look at mm-hmm. it that way. Um, Najee Marshall is the D Jones replacement. And then Quentin Grimes is the Josh Green replacement who played four years right. here. Um, could knock down the three, but I think Quentin Grimes is a much better shooter than, than Josh Green. Mm-hmm. And then he probably can give you just as much defensively. So when you look at their additions and their subtractions, I think they're either equal or upgrades. I don't think there was a downgrade at all. You want to catch the hottest games this summer, but don't want to mortgage the family home or take a second job to do so, right? Game time makes getting tickets to events like WNBA games even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. That's a huge get when it comes to getting great deals at the ballpark or basketball arena nearest you. Here in Boston, every season is sporting season. So for me, the Game Time app makes it super easy to find tickets for just about every sport in my area, which is great this time of year when family and friends just happen to pop into town at the last minute and you're scrambling to find something to do and you're trying to find something to do that won't break the bank like getting tickets to see the red hot Red Sox play who are playing some of their best baseball right now. Game Time has you covered. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And and certainly when you talk about, you know, upgrades and glue guys and things like that, everything and anything involving the Dallas Mavericks begins and ends, and even in the middle, uh, is Luka. Uh, he's everything to that franchise, and, and understandably so. A guy that young, who's as accomplished as he's been in the league, he's done. There's only two things left, really, for on his bucket list, and that's win league MVP and win a title. Uh, and you, you figure one of those two is going to is going to happen very soon. Uh, he's that good. Uh, the, the one of the things we d- we did notice during the playoffs and really throughout the regular season was that I mean, Luca plays a ton of minutes, uh, and your best players. That's that's kind of the mo. Uh, but the minutes in the playoffs, the minutes in the regular seasons, and then he had the audacity to, to play for his national team, trying to get to the Olympics, which uh, you can talk a little bit about in a minute uh, where that stands. But was there is there a concern about just the fatigue factor for Luca uh, going into next season? Because, again, that's a lot of basketball we're talking about. Yeah, one thing about it, Luka Doncic loves to play basketball. He loves to compete. If he's able to walk, I think he's going to try to play any game that he's able to. Um, And I think we saw that here when he chose to participate um, in the FIBA Olympic qualifying tournament with Slovenia this year. Um, They played a couple of exhibition games. I don't think he played the first one, but he definitely played the second one and the first three games. Um, I'm sorry, first. Yeah, first three games of this tournament, um, which they lost today, this morning to Greece. Um, in the semifinal round to Giannis Antetokounmpo um, and the rest of the Greece team. So his, 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 he's going to have the rest of the summer to kind of rehab those injuries that he had. He had a really bad knee sprain um, that he suffered throughout the, during the first round against the Clippers. Um, he had a chest contusion in the finals, and then he had an ankle sprain. He was also sick at one point. So he, he he's just – it doesn't matter if he's hurt or not. I think um, a lot of people – fans especially didn't want him to play um, for his native for his national team but I think he may enjoy that even more than he plays in the NBA because that's Mm -hmm. that's what he's done like all his life he's been a pro since he was 16 so Mm -hmm. um, I think that that that's very near and dear to his heart but um, I think it's good for Dallas that he does get this rest because had he gone on and played in the Olympics he would have had an even shorter amount of time to rest and recover for training camp in September. So September, October. So I think um, <laughs> the mass front office is probably a little bit happy that he's going to be able to get some rest. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, if, if you're the Mavs, you might want to send a thank you card to Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, <laughs> and, and his people for, for doing him a solid. Uh, because really, you know, Luca, you, as, as you pointed out, he really does, there's, there's like a, a youthful exuberant joy that he exudes when he's playing with his national team before he came to the NBA and they would just kind of show some of the clips of him playing with his national team. And he was a young man then. And you're like, Oh, you know, he's a young kid. He's playing with joy. But the more you saw him play, it was always like that. It was a different kind of passion, not so much for the competition as much as it was the camaraderie that he had with his teammates. And even in Dallas, uh, you know, you can tell that he really wants to win and he really wants his guys to do well. Uh, it's just that if, if we're being completely transparent, there aren't that many guys on his roster that are at the level or even close to the level that he's at as a basketball player. Um, and that's no knock against them because Luke is that damn good. He'd have that issue on most teams, but there just aren't a lot of legitimate top tier NBA caliber talented guys on that roster. And adding Clay Thompson gives you another one. Uh, it gives you a guy with proven credentials and a proven resume of being able to play and impact the game at a high level. And they're going to need that if they're going to make that jump, which again, they're, they're three wins away from being a champion. Uh, and, and as much as we talk about every season is its own season in itself, that muscle memory that you created does not go away. The Celtics talked about that this year. You know, they, they, go, they look back at 2022 when they, they were in position to potentially put Golden State in a tough spot uh, and they let their foot off the gas. And next thing you know, they literally don't win another game in that series. They're up 2-1 in game four and chance to really put a stranglehold in that series, lost that and never won another game. They would refuse to let that happen again. And I suspect Dallas, if they're able to get back to the finals, whether it's this year, next year or sometime in the near future, I suspect that they're going to seal the deal. Uh, and Luca, I'm like 99.9% sure is going to reflect on what happened this year as being kind of that, that necessary pain that you got to go through in order to enjoy the pleasures of success. Um, but ultimately, Mike, and, and, you know, everything that we're talking about with the Mavericks and Luca and all the changes, it all comes down to one thing. How are you going to be Boston? Because they're the champs. We, I mean, we had the conversation last year. How are you going to be Denver? Because they were the champs. And that's really what a lot of this is about. And a lot of teams are making moves to better position themselves to knock off the Celtics. And the, the question I got for you is the moves that Dallas has made. We, we talked a bit about what they, how they stack with other teams out West. But ultimately, Boston is the – they're the team everyone is gunning after. How have the moves that Dallas has made – brought them any closer, if at all, to Boston. Uh, and are and again, uh, let's, let's talk about just yeah, some of those moves and just how do they relate to the Celtics, who, as we talked about right off the top, they brought the whole band back. I mean, even freaking Luke Cornette, Xavier Tim, cats that like saw like like 30 seconds or 45 seconds, guys that didn't even play, they brought back. Like, you know, Kata, uh, young center um, from Portugal, who's Portuguese, they brought him back on a multi. He was on a two way. They're like, you know what? Forget the two way. We bring you back on a multi year deal. Come on, boy. Let's let's go. They brought the entire band back. Uh, how does Dallas match up with basically the Celtics circa twenty twenty four? The reboot. Yeah, one thing about it, I think in the NBA, continuity is very important, and we saw that with those Warriors teams um, that won four championships that Clay was a part of. Um, I think whenever you're, you're able to keep a team together, give them another shot, especially when they've earned it, when they won the championship, you got to do it. Um, you can try to get better um, by tinkering the roster around the edges or so, set, so to speak, and like not messing with the core. But I think what Boston is doing is, is, is pretty good. And I think the rest of the league, like you said, is trying to catch up. You got Philly, you got New York, New York especially. And I think every team is going after the Celtics model have as many long wings as you can and just put them out there and let them figure it out. Um, we talked to Nico Harrison at his end of the season press conference. Um, actually, it was after the draft um, when he took Melvin Agenta with the 51st pick um, in the second round. And we at, well, I asked him, like, what's what's so, um, I guess, wh why, does, why is the floor position so valuable in this league? He said, because it's one of the versatile spots on the floor. You got a guy who can literally do everything, defend, facilitate, shoot. Um, 
it, it's just a, a really a really valuable position. I think the rest of the league is trying to um, mimic what Boston did. So you mm-hmm. look at what what Dallas was able to do. You go get Clay. You go get Quentin Grimes, and you go get Najee Marshall to complement what you already have. You have PJ. You have um, Gafford and Lively, and of course you got two scores in Luca and Kyrie. And you try to see if that can work. Um, I think this team is closer to Boston, but I'm not sure how much closer because mm-hmm. top to bottom in the finals, you just, you saw it like Boston had more talent one through seven, one through eight that they could just, they were just better at. Um, especially when you, when you had Kyrie who wasn't playing like himself, um, mm-hmm. it left Luca to shoulder the load. So they were really playing with one star out there on most nights. Um, yeah. And Kyrie yeah. had a really good game that game three in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I think I think they're closer, but I'm not sure how much closer, and I'm not sure if they'll be able to beat them if they were to right. win the finals next year. And I was going to ask you, I meant to ask you earlier about Kyrie. Uh, and, and just you, you, to your point, that was very atypical Kyrie Irving we saw in the finals. And, you know, certainly you, you got to give the Celtics credit defensively because they're an elite defensive team, and so it's not unusual for guys to struggle against them. But for those of us who've seen the Celtics team defend, for those of us who've watched Kyrie play, there was a little bit more going on than just good defense. I mean, Kyrie, there, there were lots of plays that Kyrie just didn't finish. Lots of plays where he just didn't do the things that he is accustomed to doing. Uh, and it didn't have much, if at all, to do with the Celtics defense. The, I mean, in Dallas, do you kind of just chalk it up as just, you know what, it, it, it's just a Boston thing because he's been like that for most of the games he's played against Boston. He's struggled. Uh, or is there something more concerning about that? Or do you just kind of chalk it up as, just, again, that we all got that one team that we just, for whatever reason, we never do well against. And it seems like Boston is that team for Kyrie. Um, but is is it is that the sentiment or is there concern that, you know, maybe Kyrie might be slipping a little bit? I think it'd be a little bit of both. Uh, two yeah. things can be true. There's duality in all of it. I think you got Kyrie, who's 32 years of age right now. He's not getting any younger. Um, and he can't get around those lengthy defenders like he used to. Um, he still can finish up the rim. He still can shoot. He still can get to his spots. Um, but he is getting a little bit older. Um, but also, it was an emotional um, series against the Boston yeah. Celtics. There's a lot of, I want to say trauma, but a lot of <laughs> – um, things from his past that came up during, mm-hmm. with this series. He was getting asked about it every day. Every day, yep. Every day. And that that can affect you. He's hearing Kyrie sucks. Um, as much as he didn't want to admit that that could have been bothering him, I think that, that definitely played a factor in it. Um, mm-hmm. But going back to the age thing, I think we saw like glimpses of it um, throughout the first three series that, that um, the Mavericks played. Um, against the Clippers, against the OKC Thunder, and against the Minnesota Timberwolves. I think he played a lot better in that Timberwolves series than the previous two. Mm -hmm. But there were moments where Kyrie would kind of defer to Luka a little bit too much, especially in the first half, first quarters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are wondering, like, hey, where's the offensive magician that we've grown accustomed to seeing? And he pulled it out in spurts and in bursts and moments but it was never like consistent throughout the playoffs. So I think I think it can be both. It can be a sign of wear and tear, and it could also be the Celtics are just that team that um, he's going to have trouble with. But um, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens next season for sure. Yeah, Ky- but Kyrie to me, he, he's one of those old dogs, and and, and by dogs I'm, I'm speaking in a positive sense, not dog as a bad player, but one of those old dogs that you need to let lie. You don't need to be, poke the, you don't need to poke him. And Anthony Edwards poked him. And next thing you know, Kyrie 2024 became Kyrie circa 2017. I mean, he was in his bag deep. Uh, and there was no lint pulled up when he went in his bag. Everything was nice and shiny. There was nothing that was antiquated. It was like tw- he was so good in that series. I'm thinking like, damn, if he could play like this. Going forward, they absolutely have a shot at winning a chip uh, because this Kyrie is is damn near unstoppable when he's locked in and and he's feeling good about himself. But the Celtics, and, and if you noticed, uh, they did nothing to poke Kyrie. Everything was complimentary. Everything was like, look, you know, we get along great now. You know, he's with another team. We wish him the best of luck. It was nothing but love for that brother until they got between the lines. 
Yeah, I will say, um, I think it was after the first game, I asked Kyrie, like, did the crowd meet or exceed his expectations? And he said that I thought it was going to be louder. And, you know, the you, Celtics, yep, that was your question. Celtics marketing team put that on the big screen. I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be louder. And it just it just helped fuel the crowd even more. So even yeah, if the he, players didn't play those right. type of games, I think the organization did. Absolutely. And the thing is, the, to me, the irony of that is that people were afraid that the Celtics would do something to get Kyrie going, when in fact it was Kyrie who got the fans going. Uh, I remember seeing that on the on the Jumbotron, and I was like, oh, boy. The funny part about it, though, we I had a conversation after I saw the quote. We had a group text. Uh, and I mentioned that, man, if I'm Celtics PR, I'm all on this because that's you want your crowd involved. You want them to feel engaged. And that was just catnip that they just could not resist, uh, could not resist. So uh, Kyrie brought a little bit of that hate that that came his way on, on himself. But at the end of the day, and, and no matter how you feel about Kyrie, the one thing that I think we all agree on is he's a hell of a player. Uh, one of the yeah. best of this generation. Uh, he will be a Hall of Famer. I think he should be a first ballot Hall of Famer personally because I think whenever you win a championship, you make as many all-star teams as he has. You've been to the finals with more than one team. Uh, mm-hmm. And you again, you have a skill set that sets you apart from others. I mean, when you talk about handles, Kyrie is on the very short list. To me, it's a, yeah. it's a list of one uh, as far as handles. I think he has the best handles in the game. Uh, and if you want to talk top all time, I think he's on that short list as well. Uh, but unlike some folks in the broadcast game, I don't consider him and Luca the greatest backcourt of all time. Uh, I think there's a lot of backcourts that would say, uh, you know, hold my beer. Let me show you my receipts to show you why we might be the best one. Uh, but at the end of the day, he is an exceptional player who's had an exceptional career. And if he's able to play up to that level, certainly Dallas will be very thick in the, in, in the mix of, of competing for another title. I have one more thing for you, Michael, and then I'm going to get you out of here. Uh, yeah. we like, I like to play a game called pick and roll where you pick a position and then you actually know we're not going to do pick and roll. We're going to fill the lane today. We're going to play fill the lane where mm-hmm. I will make a statement and you fill in the blank or you fill the lane. And this qu- today's statement is blank must happen for the Dallas Mavericks to get back to the NBA Finals in 2025. There's a lot of things that can happen, but what's the one thing you think has to happen for them to get back to the NBA Finals? I think Luka must con- must come back healthy, and he also okay. must come back um, with an improved conditioning um, and an improved Facts. mindset towards the referees um yeah because i think every time i've seen him ignore the conversations with the officials and just play next play mentality not lingering on to the previous play and putting his hands up i think we've seen the, one of the best versions of luka Doncic that we can see and also yep. conditioning um i looked at the ro- i was looking through the roster the other day and I saw that Luca and PJ Washington are both six foot seven, and they both weigh two hundred and thirty pounds. Wow. But they look completely different. <laughs> I, I know, like everybody's body type is different, and right? Not, but this is two people who are the same size, same height, same weight, and but they look different. And I think if if Luca kind of cut down on um, just some some of some of the weight and get his conditioning better and he's able to maintain that from start to finish. I think it, it puts him in a better position to play through June, not run out of gas, maybe not even get hurt as much as he as much as he did this season. Um, I think that puts them in a really good position to to get back to the finals next year. That's a great, great, great point you brought up, Michael. Because again, as that as the playoffs wore on and you're watching him play, it, it was clear as day that he was starting to wear down. And and it doesn't necessarily show in his scoring because he's always going to be a guy that can go out there and get you 25 points. It showed more so in his just just lack of impact. Uh, there were stretches when they needed him to really be that guy, and he just didn't have the juice to, to be that guy. So that, that certainly his, his conditioning will be something to be on lookout for, and it does need improvement. And, hey, you got time now to work on your body. You ain't got games to play. You you, you can do this. And I, I just I, I wonder if the Mavericks are actually ever going to get to the point where they say, Luca, you got to get in better shape. 
Um, are they going to have that that uncomfortable but necessary conversation about his conditioning? Uh, I think someone needs to have that. I mean, Jason Kidd, you know, th- th- to me, that conversation could be the difference between Dallas becoming a champion and them simply being a team that can make a deep playoff run. Because they, because with Luca as he is, they can do that. We know they can do that. But what can he do to improve himself and this organization and his team? And you're right, Michael. I mean, better conditioning. That I, I would absolutely put that at the top of the to do list for him this summer. Uh, the crazy so, thing, he's still only 25 years old. I think a lot of people forget right, that he's still only 25 right. years old, but he's so accomplished that we put him on a pedestal to be greater than what he's already shown to be. I think it's because. It's, it's, it's similar to how a lot of people treated LeBron. They right. knew he had the um, potential to become a multiple time champion, but it wasn't until he actually went and learned how to do it and got with someone who's been there before in Dwayne Wade. Luke is now with someone who's been there before in Kyrie and Clay. So I think I think he'll probably reap the results and fruits of that um, in the near future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we are reaping the fruits of you, my friend, doing your thing at the Dallas Morning News, covering the Dallas Mavericks. This is Mike Curtis. Uh, before we get out of here, just want a quick shout out to Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media Network, and also our good friends at Game Time, which takes the guesswork out of buying last minute tickets to your favorite sporting events. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Uh, download the app. Uh, App, game time app, create an account, use the code CLNS, get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. For my good friend Michael Curtis, this is H. Rob Blakely, and this is the Big Three NBA Podcast. Thanks, folks. Thanks.